Welcome everyone to our series on the most important battles in the Civil War. This is possibly our marquee episode, the Battle of Gettysburg. If you know very little about the Civil War, which before the series, I would include myself in this camp. And depending on what you think of my opinions, you might still think I'm in that camp, but definitely not James, who has been guiding us through this very well. We are going to look at the Battle of Gettysburg. If you remember in the last episode, we looked at the fall of Vicksburg, which was a critical city that allowed the Confederacy to maintain control of the Mississippi River, allowed it to ferry equipment and troops up and down it, most importantly, gave them access to the American West and Mexico and gave them the supplies they needed to continue the war effort. Vicksburg fell, which some refer to Vicksburg as one of, if not the turning points of the Civil War. But at the end of Vicksburg, after the city's fall, news came from the east of something else that happened that was catastrophic for the Confederacy, but we didn't mention what that was. Well, Gettysburg, you may have heard about it in class if you're from the United States. Some have also considered it the turning point of the Civil War. Um, but before I say why, I don't want to do any spoilers if this is a spoiler for you, just to set a tiny bit of the stage before James picks it up, this is following Lee's incredible victory in Chancellorsville. He's probably riding higher than any other point in the war, and he wants to solidify his advantage, and he wants to attack again. But something is about to change on the Union side. The leadership is different than what we saw with previous generals. So let's start off with uh, the big context. So James, what's happening with the strategic situation in the East, in May and June of 1863. We're out in the West, or the Midwest, as we would call it now. But what's happening in the East? Okay, in the East, it has not gone well at all for the Union. It has just been one disaster after another. <laughs> the Union had lost several battles in a row, or at best, they'd had a draw here and there. But especially recently, we saw in December of 1862, an absolute Union disaster in the Battle of Fredericksburg. And then we saw another Union disaster at the Battle of Chancellorsville, which was in May of 1863. Lincoln could not find an army commander that he could trust. He just kept going through them. We started, just to refresh everybody's memory on our commanders, we started with Irvin McDowell. He lost at the first Battle of Bull Run, and he was swept aside. It was replaced by McClellan. McClellan just piddled and diddled and wasted time and was too cautious. He had the, uh, he attempted the uh, kind of a sideways movement toward Richmond in the Peninsula campaign, but that ended up being an overall Union failure. And then Lincoln went to a, another general named John Pope, who promptly lost the second Battle of Bull Run. And so he was sent away to fight Indians in the West. Then McClellan was given the mantle once again, and McClellan chased Lee into Maryland and didn't lose the Battle of Antietam. It certainly wasn't a Union loss, but it wasn't a smashing victory like it should have been because we talked about how um, McClellan had found a copy of Lee's orders. It should have been a Union victory, and they had a chance to cut them off, but of course McClellan failed on that. Finally, McClellan was fired. He was replaced by Ambrose Burnside, who despite having great facial hair, <laughs> was not a good commander in, in any form or fashion. He lost at Fredericksburg. By that time, Lincoln decided on a one-strike-you're-out policy. So, <laughs> so he, was, he was sent packing and replaced by Joseph Hooker, fighting Joe, who was supposed to be so tough, but he lost his nerve and got outfoxed by Lee and Jackson. So Hooker now has been replaced also. We're going to try somebody else. We'll talk about who that man was in just a minute. But I want to talk a little bit about the political situation. The lack of Union success in the East was encouraging a peace movement in the North. There were a group of anti-war Democrats called Copperheads, and they said the war needed to be ended right away and that the Union just ought to be restored the way it was. You also had war Democrats who were in favor of the war, but certainly not emancipation. We talked about in our special episode on emancipation how the war was gradually moving in the direction of being a war to end slavery as well as to preserve the union. But the Democrats wanted no part of that. They just wanted to 
in the case of the war Democrats, defeat the rebels and then go back to the way things were. In the case of the Copperheads or the Peace Democrats, they just wanted to just stop, just peace now at any price, pretty much. And the Union had to impose a draft in 1863. The Confederacy had done it one year earlier, but the Union was running out of volunteers. And as we've seen, men are being killed in these battles in the tens of thousands. So they imposed the draft, but the draft was very unpopular, especially in uh, certain cities like New York City. Was It was very, very unpopular. There were, there's going to be draft riots later. But this draft encouraged the anti-war movement. Uh, it's funny, when we think of anti-war movements, we think of Vietnam, but there was a pretty decent-sized anti-war movement during the Civil War as well. And this, so this draft gains the Copperhead's support. So those are some Union problems. Now let's turn it on, on its head and let's look at Confederate opportunities. We saw, again, just it bears repeating one more time, that the two main Union armies in the East, the, the Army of the Northern Virginia under General Robert E. Lee and the Union Army of the Potomac under General Joseph Hooker, they faced each other in Northern Virginia. There, they had had the Battle of Chancellorsville, but after that, uh, both armies pretty much just stayed where they were. Bragg, uh, General Braxton Bragg, who was out in the West in the Tennessee area, he and General William Rosecrans faced each other in East Tennessee. We talked about that a while back. Grant was operating against Vicksburg, so we're going back in time a little bit. We had already concluded the siege of Vicksburg in our last episode, but now we're going back a little bit earlier, so Grant is in front of Vicksburg, he's laying siege to the city. Now, some Confederate leaders, including Jefferson Davis, believed Virginia was not all that important. They felt Lee should send part of his army to the west to reinforce Bragg and or Pemberton, who was the commander at Vicksburg. But Lee would have no part of it. He wanted to keep his whole army. He did not want to send anybody west. And Lee had a new plan to invade the north once again. Because, as we've seen before, um, armies eat, and they eat a lot especially great big armies like these where you have around 100,000 men. So Virginia is starting to be stripped bare of all of its crops. And Lee feels like in order to keep his army alive, just to keep them fed, he's got to go somewhere else. So he's going to try to repeat what he had done more or less a year before. And he thought if he could go into the north, it, he would strengthen the peace movement. And maybe we could get enough... Uh, I guess, anti-war sentiment built up to where Lincoln might be defeated in 1864 and a Democrat would come into office who would negotiate a peace and allow the Confederacy to exist. Everybody knew Lincoln was not about to do that. So Lee's going to go north again, and he feels like if he could do a successful invasion, it might still lead to British or French recognition of the Confederacy. We saw that after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, this made it really, really hard for Britain or France to come in on the side of the South. But Lee thought, well, maybe they will anyway. Maybe if they see that the, the South is for real, the Confederacy has a real army that can not just defeat invading Union armies, but can also take the war, go on the offensive, take it in the North, then maybe they'll say, yeah, these guys are for real and they'll recognize us. So that's what we're looking at. Right. And it's not as cockamania plan as people might think now. Um, in some ways, the battles that you mentioned earlier in Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg, it represents maybe the best of Lee, uh, a uh, aggressive uh, commander who can take advantage of a much slower opponent, uh, outmaneuver him and outflank him and uh, concentrate forces in Virginia and push upward. Some argue that Gettysburg is almost the worst of Lee, where he, um, to the complete um, just disinterest of any other location, he focuses on Virginia and doesn't send troops elsewhere. And we mentioned at the very beginning of the series that for the Confederates, yes, they were always outnumbered, but many themselves believe that they maybe could have the same stroke of fortune as the American revolutionaries to be able to defeat a technically and numerically superior foe on their home turf uh, through enough grit and determination. And this is probably one of the high points of how Lee considers himself and how others consider him with the Confederacy. And they're swelling with pride. Perhaps this leads to some of the overconfident steps. We'll see later, like Pickett's charge. Uh, but there's one thing that um, Lee says to Hood about the men in the Army of Northern Virginia. And he says, I agree with you in believing that our army would be invincible if it could be properly organized and officered. 
There never were such men in an army before. They will go anywhere and do anything if properly led. So his confidence about his soldiers, I mean, it makes him think that the Army of Northern Virginia was practically invincible. And there are some other generals who um, almost have the same kind of sentiment and uh, tremendous confidence in Lee that he can lead his men to great victory and um, follow whatever order he gives him. So that's some of the context. All right. So what happens when Lee moves north? Okay, before we head north, or before Lee heads north, I need to mention that he had sent one of his corps, the one under General Longstreet, he sent them off basically on a giant foraging expedition. They they went to try to find food, and they so they were separated for a while. Uh, Longstreet was not even at the Battle of Chancellorsville, but now he comes back, and so Lee's got his full army. He's got 75,000 men. And they're feeling very, their morale is extremely high. They're feeling very confident, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, I, I'm reminded of this saying, my dad was a Marine and very proud of it, of course, like every Marine, and, and rightly so. And he had this sign one time that said, the Marines have done so much with so little for so long that they can do anything with nothing forever. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Lee, I mean, Lee wasn't commanding Marines, but I think he kind of felt that way. And a lot of his men did as well. It's just simply amazing to think that Lee's army was always outnumbered, always outsupplied. The other army was fed better. They had better clothing. They had better shoes. They had better equipment. And yet Lee just kept winning and winning. So it's time to take a shot at going north one more time. So here we go. Uh, Lee's army had had two corps. And remember, a corps is roughly, I don't know, maybe... 15,000 to 20,000, or maybe even more in this case, maybe up to 40,000 in some cases. But he had had two corps, one under Longstreet, one under Jackson. Now Stonewall Jackson is dead, of course. He was really Lee's right-hand man, his most trusted subordinate. Longstreet is also very, very much a valuable subordinate to Lee. But now he's got to bring some new people up and kind of move them up through the ranks. And so he cuts Jackson's corps into two making a total of three now, one under Longstreet, one under a fellow named A.P. Hill, and one under Richard Ewell. All these men are Virginians, by the way, except for Longstreet. He called Longstreet my old war horse. He was one of only two generals that Lee actually gave a nickname to, and I'll save the other one for later. <laughs> June 9th, Lee was preparing to set off. His cavalry, led by Jeb Stuart, was attacked by Union cavalry under Alfred Pleasanton at the Battle of Brandy Station. This is interesting because it's the largest cavalry battle ever held or ever fought in the Northern Hemisphere. There were 10,000 men on each side, and in the end, Stuart drove the attacking Federals away. And let me uh, just say one more thing real quick, and that is that cavalry, I'm sure people have have heard the earlier episodes, right? You have? If not, turn this off and go listen to the earlier ones. <laughs> but just in case you haven't, you're joining us for the first time, cavalry was basically the equivalent of the uh, military intelligence back in the days. They were, I'm not going to say spies. They weren't spies, but they were the reconnaissance. Right, they, reconnaissance. they were what you had in, in lieu of air surveillance and certainly not satellites. That was the best way, cavalry was the best way for a commander to be informed of his enemy's numbers and his layout, his disposition, where everybody was stationed, and even things like who is in command of which group, which is very important information to have. You would often, Lee would base his attacks on who was in command. If let, Let's say on the right side of the Union line had a weak commander, he would hit them instead of the other side, which maybe had a stronger one. And this is an interesting point because you actually see the Union, maybe for the first time, they initiate and sustain credible offensive and they locate the position of the Army of Northern Virginia. And uh, I know you'll talk about Stuart more. He's quite a character. But mm -hmm. uh, this sort of being caught off guard could very well um, cause him to initiate an action that leads to a, a definite lack of intelligence on the part of the Confederacy. Um, because, like you said, they're the reconnaissance or the intelligence group. But um, one more question for you, James, before you move forward. Now, sure. For people who haven't been in the military, sometimes it's hard to visualize what these battles can look like. But um, if you've been to a site, you can imagine troops marching in formation. Maybe if you've been in Europe to a World War II site, you can see tanks and you can put that together. 
But this is much harder to imagine because we don't use cavalry today in the 21st century. And 10,000 men on each side. I mean, can you just paint a picture? now? And you've been to just about every major Civil War battle site. I have not. Uh, so maybe you could get a sense. And I know you've been a reenactor as well. So there had to be at least a few guys with horses there. And you could maybe extrapolate that. But what would this even look like of 10,000 men on each side with cavalry? Are they charging each other? Or, or what is this? They are. It's a much less methodical type of warfare than infantry. We've talked a little in the past about infantry tactics. They would line up in long, long, long lines, too deep. And when they went on the attack, they didn't just charge and go bonsai like you see in the movie sometimes. They would march very slowly and methodically. It was all about keeping your lines straight and keeping your gaps filled. If Let's say you had a, a portion of your line where a bunch of people were killed and fell down. Then you would fill in the gap. Uh, you would close ranks. It was very important to keep this solid wall of men going forward. Cavalry is completely different, obviously, because every single person's on a horse. And they are going, obviously, much faster. It's almost impossible to keep a whole lot of organization. The horses are trained to – they're trained to as best they can to – not be spooked by things like cannon and by uh, you know, regular small arms fire, but of course they still do from time to time. So horses are running here and there. Men are getting thrown off of their horses. Sometimes your horse gets shot out from under you, and so then all of a sudden, bang, you're not cavalry anymore. You're now infantry, right? You're, you're what they would call dismounted cavalry. So much less organized, much more... I want to say wild, but maybe wild is not the right word, but just freewheeling, uh, kind of just fast moving combat, very hard to keep up with what's going on. The officers are firing uh, small arms, very small arms like pistols. Some of the uh, enlisted men might have smaller carbines and, and the union is starting to have repeating carbines now. And I'm not sure I'm not, I can't get down to the level of, the individual soldiers' arms at this one battle. I'm not uh, real super uh, knowledgeable about Brandy Station, but nevertheless, one thing you kind of alluded to this, and one thing I will say is we are starting to see the rise of the Union cavalry. At the beginning of the war, the Confederate cavalry was way better than the Union cavalry in general because it just like every that was part of southern culture riding a horse and, and of course everybody knew how to ride a horse back then but it was really stressed in the south and and part of the, the mystique of the southern gentleman where you would be gallant you'd ride a horse and people did it for sport and they did it to impress each other uh that we saw that at the beginning of the war but over time the union got better and better at cavalry and by the end i think you could even say that the union cavalry is is actually better than the Confederate here, I'd say at this battle, they're about equal, but yeah, Stuart is kind of dealt a little bit of a sting here and Stuart's pride is going to be very much wounded and it's definitely going to affect what happens in the battle that's to come. Let me talk about Stuart real quick. Um, Stuart, as you mentioned, is an interesting character. He was a young man. He was 30 years old at the time. He was a West Point grad. He had fought in the Indian wars out West and he was the picture of the cavalier, the southern gentleman. The, like, he wanted to be a modern-day knight, minus the armor, of course. <laughs> he wore uh, a very elaborate uniform. He wore a, a fancy hat with a feather, big feather plume in it. And uh, he also had this epic, epic beard. I mean, you, can't, you see pictures of him, you can't even see his mouth at all. That, now, that's a beard and a mustache, I tell you what. And I think, didn't he uh, march in a bunch of parades, him and his men, on the way up to Brandy Station? Like, all the pageantry or... Uh, he definitely liked to do that, yes. He, uh, I'm not sure if he did exactly at this time. He probably did. I mean, if you could... You can just bet on that, and you'd probably be right. He really liked publicity... He liked to see his name in the papers. Uh, he was definitely one of Lee's most trusted subordinates. He was in charge of all the cavalry and the Union Army. I'm mean, sorry, the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, and he was very good at intel intelligence gathering. But as I said before, his pride was stung. So let's move on with Lee moving north. Lee, um, Lee was started to move his army 
to the north and they moved very quickly. They tended to move faster than the Confederate army. I'm sorry, I'm getting them all mixed up. The Confederates moved fast. The okay. Union tended to move slow. Right. Uh, we've seen Jackson's foot cavalry. Those men, the ones that survived, are part of this army, even though Jackson is gone. On June 16th, the Confederates begin crossing the Potomac, and they start to fan out over southern Pennsylvania. They cross Maryland. Maryland at this point is very thin, so it doesn't take long to get from Virginia through Maryland and into Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania, this part of the country, is rich in farms. You can imagine the, the Confederates are licking their lips, thinking, oh, man, <laughs> they're talking about bacon, and they're talking about ham, and they're talking about beef, and all this good stuff they're going to steal from the Yankees. Actually, they're not going to steal it. They... They, they do seize food, and they do pay for it, but they pay for it with Confederate money, which is pretty much useless in the North. <laughs> so thanks a lot, man. Yeah. Monopoly money, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. You, you might as well uh, you know, walk into a restaurant somewhere in the U.S. and give them pesos or something. It's not going to work. I've seen plenty of Americans uh, try to do things with dollars in countries where it doesn't work at all. So, yeah, it's yeah. Not, not, not as implausible as you can imagine. Uh, yeah, well, that's all they had. I mean, they probably had some greenbacks stowed away somewhere, but they're not going to depart with that. And here's a really sad thing that happened. This is tragic. Whenever they found free blacks, of whom there were quite a few, they seized them and they sent them south into slavery. They had a very hard line about slavery. Um, we're going to talk. We're going to take a little bit of an excursus about African American. Uh, soldiers and sailors in a future episode so i'll save an you know save that for then but but i'll suffice it to say now that whenever they caught any kind of free blacks whether they were in the army or whether they're not in the army they if they could they would if they sometimes they would just kill them but usually that wasn't very profitable they would just send them to the south and they'd be returned to slavery or put into slavery for the first time in some cases Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Are you concerned about tensions in the Middle East? Do you wonder where we're currently at in the biblical timeline? Are we really in the last days? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carl Muller with the Inside the Epicenter podcast. Every week, my co-host, best-selling author Joel Rosenberg, and I answer those questions and more. You'll hear inside knowledge of our meetings with leaders at the highest levels of government in the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East, equipping you to filter the news with biblically sound insights. Find Inside the Epicenter on your favorite podcast app or go to joshuafund.com to listen and subscribe. Hello, this is Dr. Doug Grothuis, host of Truth Tribe, where we seek the truth through reason and evidence about what matters most. And we are not tribal since truth is for everyone. Please join me at the Truth Tribe as I discuss the reasons for Christian faith, the Christian worldview, and moral issues such as abortion and gender ideology. To listen now, go to lifeaudio.com or search Truth Tribe on your favorite podcast app. So General Hooker, the, still the Union commander, he realizes that he wants to capture Richmond. Or he tells Lincoln, because he knows Lee is moving to the north, he wants to turn around and go south and capture Richmond. And Lincoln says, uh, no, you dummy. That would be an idiotic thing to do. No, he didn't say that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lincoln was much more uh, <laughs> polite. Lincoln said, go after Lee. What's the point of taking the Confederate capital if Robert E. Lee and 75,000 men are marching all over the North? And who knows? They might could even attack Washington. Hooker quarreled with Lincoln about other issues as well as this, and he finally submitted his resignation, which Lincoln gladly accepted. <laughs> Lincoln was really hoping. Lincoln didn't like firing these guys. Uh, they all had their supporters within the Northern public, but Lincoln realized, I, I can't have this guy, first of all, who lost his head in this battle that he should have won at Chancellorsville. And second of all, he's constantly quarreling with me. So Hooker is out and Lee, I'm sorry, Lincoln, I keep saying the wrong people. Lincoln has to find a new commander. So 
On June 27th, he appoints one of the Corps commanders named George Gordon Meade. George Meade. And he makes him the, ar- the commander of the Army of the Potomac. This is the fourth commander of the Army in just seven months. Meade was another West Pointer. He had worked his way up through the Army ranks, and he had done well. But he had a really bad temper, and he had these big bug eyes, and people called him the damned old goggle-eyed snapping turtle. <laughs> goggle-eyed snapping turtle. Wow. Yeah, that, so, yeah, not, not the most beloved man in the Army, but, but competent. He had done well at all the lower levels, so let's give him a chance now. And he, one thing you can say, he was good with logistics. He was good with topography. He understood the value of good ground, and that's really going to come in handy not too far in the future. He was a former engineer, so a very, very intelligent man. Let's see how he does as an Army commander. Now, let's talk one more time about Stuart real quick. General Stuart, he was, as we said, stung by his failure to defeat the Yankees at Brandy Station, and he's determined to redeem himself. So he does this crazy thing, or I guess I shouldn't evaluate it. <laughs> I'm, don't evaluate as a historian. But he, he makes a long ride around the Union Army. He and his his cavalry troop, they go all the way around the Union Army, which is huge. We talked, the Union Army uh, has like 100,000 people so or more. And it, and it takes him a very, very long time to make this complete run around the Army and this deprives Lee of valuable intelligence. Lee doesn't hear from Stuart. Every day, Lee's thinking, where is Stuart? Where is Stuart? Where is Stuart? I don't, I'm, I'm blind. I don't know where the Union Army is going, how many people they have. Don't know who's in command. And because there's always, you know, once obviously there's a shakeup. Once Meade is uh, elevated to the head of the whole army, somebody has to replace Meade and so on and so on. Plus you have people killed. Uh, Lee finally does learn about Meade's appointment, and he learns about the Union march northward. But instead of learning them from Jeb Stewart, which he should have done, he learns them from an actor. <laughs> How? Was he going from one theater performance to another? Or how does this work? Yeah, you know, I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm just making my way through town from performance to performance. I thought I'd stop by and say hi. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he was actually, this actor was named Harrison, and he worked for Longstreet. He was a part... Former actor, he wasn't doing a lot of acting these days, but he was working as a scout. Uh, Lee, once Lee realizes that Meade is coming his way, he orders his army to reconcentrate, and their orders are to meet at a small town called Gettysburg, which is obviously in Pennsylvania. Let me stop and just let's just go ahead and get this out of the way now, because I know our some of our people that are listening are saying. Talk about the movie. Talk about the movie. <laughs> so you know me. If you've been listening to this series, I love movies about history. Yep. Take a shot. And we might as well. I'm going to be constantly referring to this. Uh, there is a fantastic movie called Gettysburg. If you haven't seen it, you must see it. It is. It's long. It is really long. It is more than four hours long, but it is well worth it. It's one of the best historical movies I've ever seen. It is based on a book, which I also highly recommend. The book is called The Killer Angels. It came out in, I think, 1973, 74, maybe. And it actually won the Pulitzer Prize by a man named Michael Shara, S-H-A-A-R-A. So look that up, folks. The Killer Angels by Michael Shara. That's the book. And it's written from the perspective of all the different commanders. So there'll be a chapter where you get to get into Lee's head and a chapter where you get to get into... General Meade's head, and then you get to get into uh, Longstreet's head and so on. So you're seeing the different perspectives of all the different commanders. And it's just, it's, it is my favorite historical novel I have ever read. So Killer Angels and the movie Gettysburg is based on it. But even though it is a movie that is based on a, a fiction, fictional book, it's still completely accurate in the way they portray Civil War combat and a lot of the dialogue between the characters is actual dialogue that they said. Others is speculation, but it's just really, really, really good. And there's a one, there's a funny part where uh, Longstreet tells Lee about what this actor has told him about the Federal's movement. And he says, we need to move. We need to concentrate. And Lee says, we're going to move our army on the word of an actor. <laughs> it's really kind of funny because actors back then didn't have much of a reputation. Uh, I don't know if they still do or not. <laughs> anyway, 
So there you go. Uh, so they're going to, the army, the Southern army is a little spread out, but they're going to concentrate and they're looking for supplies and they're going to end up in Gettysburg. Yeah. And that's an interesting point too. Um, the gallantry that you mentioned with the self mythologizing of the Southern gentleman, this really seems to go to Stuart's head because the order that he has from Lee is, um, to meet, he has, he has a vague order. I'm not sure if it's to meet at Gettysburg or elsewhere, but um, the discretion of how he arrives is completely left up to him, and this is a characteristic of Lee. He gives ambiguous orders that um, has its strengths and weaknesses as a command tactic for someone like Stonewall Jackson. It's excellent, but how that works out with Stuart is that he wants to go on an exciting and glorious you know, route. It's a quest almost, so... The way that he goes is what um, a book Edward Bonnekemper calls a meaningless frolic and detour, where he's very delayed in rejoining Lee. Like you said, he doesn't give him critical intelligence. He swings east of the northward moving Union army. His He separated his troops from the rest of Lee's army. So he had no idea where Lee was, and he headed farther north. He passed by Gettysburg, um, and then he was able to get by. But at one point, I think he captures a wagon train, and he regards it as the spoils of war, or precious booty. So that slows him down too. So, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, it's a small thing, but Lee is lacking critical strategic intelligence. So this is going to affect him on day one. Uh, so let's do it. Let's get to day one. What happens? I was just going to follow up on what you said. This illustrates the, the statement in the Bible that says. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know, Stuart's pride is going to cost not only him, but the entire Confederate army. All right. So part of Lee's army, uh, one of his divisions under a commander named Henry Heath, we won't really hear from him again, but they march into the town of Gettysburg and they're looking for shoes. The rebels dearly needed these shoes. A lot of the men were barefoot. Others, their shoes were just uh, falling apart. They were going to be barefoot pretty soon. It's very hard to march uh, on rocky ground and uh, just all these places they had to march with uh, bare feet. <laughs> so um, it's interesting that the the South, they point this out in the Ken Burns Civil War miniseries, which I also highly recommend. The South came in from the North and the North came in from the South. There's all kinds of ironies here. So Heath's division is in Gettysburg looking for shoes, and then all of a sudden, they didn't expect this at all, surprise, they run into a division of Union cavalry led by John Buford. John Buford was uh, a, in one of the top Union Confederate cap. I mean, yeah, I didn't, Union Confederates. That's a, that's interesting. That's a, that would be a interesting <laughs> that's a, thing. Yeah. A double agent. No, I'm kidding, folks. He was purely Union. John Buford was a cavalry commander. He is played by Sam Elliott in the movie Gettysburg, and uh, I imagine most of our listeners know who Sam Elliott is, the man with the epic mustache. He's been in so many Westerns and other war movies. And Big Lebowski, we can't forget that. Yeah, and he played the general in the Hulk movie, too. I can't remember if it's the first one, or I think it's maybe all of them, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so there's John Buford, and surprise, we end up having a fight, which neither side really expected. But before long, both sides start pouring reinforcements into the battle, and it, a small skirmish turns into a pretty good-sized battle. Uh, General Ewell, Richard Ewell, he was one of the two new corps commanders. Who, he had taken over half of Jackson's corps. Uh, he's, his corps is coming down from the north, and they're able to flank the Union left. And i got to work in Jubal early to every, yeah. uh, <laughs> everyone. You, you're your every- so-called forefather, yeah. Yeah, my, my not forefather, but um, my namesake, Jubal Early, was a division commander under Ewell. He was kind of Ewell's right-hand man. He was he was fighting really hard here. And so Ewell and Early are pushing the Federals back. Lee gives an order to continue to keep fighting, keep pushing. Uh, the outnumbered Union soldiers, only two corps, they were shattered. And one corps lost half their numbers as casualties, half of them. You know, you start out with, say, 10,000, and you end up with 5,000. I just made those numbers up, but that's just to illustrate how bad it was. The Federals retreat back through the town of Gettysburg. They're moving toward the toward the south and toward the east. Uh, they're eventually rallied by General Winfield Scott Hancock, and he's a very competent Union Corps commander, and they occupy high ground to the east of the town. A couple of hills 
Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, and then there's Cemetery Ridge. There's obviously Cemetery Ridge is named after a cemetery that's at the top of it. And so they're, they're entrenching and digging in on this, beginning to at least on this high ground. And it's kind of ironic because at the entrance to the cemetery, there was a sign that said, all persons found using firearms in these grounds will be prosecuted with the utmost rigor of the law. <laughs> The local sheriff had a full caseload on his hands that day. Yeah, he's going to have about almost 200,000 people he's going to have to deal with. But anyway, Lee ordered Ewell to continue the attack. It's starting to get late in the day. Uh, but here's one of these ambiguous orders that we keep talking about. Scott and I have mentioned this several times. Lee said, attack and take the hill, meaning Culp's Hill, which is, um, I'll, I'll make a mental map in a minute, but it's on the Union right he says, take the hill if practicable. And that's that that's the those two mm. words made all the difference in the world. If he had had Stonewall Jackson, Stonewall Jackson would have said, well, heck yeah, it's practical. I'm going to do it. Uh, but Ewell was a m much more cautious man, and he didn't think it was practicable. He made a couple of attempts, but it was not going well, and so he backs off. And so the first day comes to an end. This is July 1st, by the way. Uh, it's a major tactical tactical success for the Confederacy in that they pushed the Federals back and inflicted many casualties. But it's not all rainbows and butterflies for the Confederacy, as we're going to see. That evening, the rest of both armies arrive. So the, both armies pull up, and, including Meade. Meade arrives on the field, the, the new commander. He's only been in command of this army for five or six days. There's only one Confederate division that hasn't made it. That's Pickett's, and they're gonna they're gonna be busy in a couple days. But the Blue Coats, the Union troops, they spend all night entrenching, building breastworks. So they are now on this great ground, fantastic ground, elevated at the top of hills and ridges, and they're building breastworks. So basically, we talked about breastworks. They are man-made walls. Well, I guess technically all walls are man-made, right? Right. <laughs> but, but uh, they're not stone walls. They, they're they not brick walls. They are walls made out of logs and uh, mud and other types of natural things that you put together. But they're still very, very effective in stopping bullets. The Confederate Army was wrapped around the Union position, which resembled a fish hook. As I mentioned, the Federals now occupy high ground and they have good interior lines. That's another concept we've talked about so uh, I'm having a trouble here, let's see, doing a mental map. So picture, you know what we can do is everybody picture a letter C and then just chop off the bottom part of the C. So you get what looks like like a fish hook or like, uh, I don't know, how would you describe it, Scott? Like a, uh, like a, back, a backwards two with no bottom. Uh, it's just a big curvy line. The Union right is on one hill and then it curves around. And then they're on this ridge, and then on the Union left, which is the bottom of the fish hook, there's two hills, little round top and big round top. So terrific ground. And not only that, they're digging in, and it's going to make it very, very hard for the Confederates to make any progress against that terrific ground. Yeah, and this is interesting because um, it's a little bit uncharacteristic of what we've seen so far, where... Lee's, he's reluctant to command an all-out assault on the first day. And like we said, maybe it could have been a mistranslation in the orders. But something that's happening, like you mentioned, not all the divisions have arrived yet. And the Confederates have as good of numbers as they can hope to have uh, for all of Gettysburg, I would imagine. Because Lee knew that a lot of the Union Army hadn't arrived yet. And um, I think he outnumbered the Union in, on the first day. But with every hour that goes by, more could possibly show up. And it's something that he is aware of. Uh, there's a statement he made the next day on July 2nd that he says, We did not or could not pursue our advantage of yesterday, and now the enemy are in good position. So it kind of seems like a rebuke of Early and Ewell, but... He'd have to have some kind of responsibility, too. I mean, he is the overall commander. So they didn't have as many casualties as the Union did. But he didn't have an opportunity to really press an attack uh, when he had the numbers. Is it, do you think it was just the confusion of orders um, that caused there not to be a decisive strike? Or do you think it was something else? I think it was a combination of the confusion of the orders, plus the fact that Ewell, is, he's new to Corps command. He's cautious. 
He's not Stonewall Jackson. He's not even Longstreet. He's just reluctant to send his men up there against this these Union soldiers who are on top of a hill and get them cut to pieces. He he thinks it would be better to wait till the next day when he's got some reinforcements brought in. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Someone's going to get cut to pieces here in a little bit. So, mm-hmm. um, all right. Well, let's look at day two. What's going on? Okay, so. Longstreet, General James Longstreet, who we talked about before, Longstreet is a little bit more forward thinking. And he, as a tactician, and he's also very defensive minded. And he really, Longstreet is the hero of the Killer Angels and the movie Gettysburg that's based on the book. Longstreet tells Lee, we need to move. We need to redeploy the army. He wants to try to move it around to the south and to the east and place it between Washington and the federal army so that the federals would have to come out of their entrenchments and attack the Confederacy, possibly even on ground of the Confederates choosing. And that might actually maybe have been a better idea than what actually happened. It's hard to say. You know, it's a counterfactual. We don't know for sure what would have happened. But Lee refused. He said, he, I'm going to paraphrase first. Well, I'll give, I'll give the exact quote. He says, no, I'm going to whip them here or they're going to whip me. Uh, in the movie and the book, they have him say to Longstreet, oh, I can't. He says, the enemy is there. I cannot order this army to retreat. And Longstreet says, not retreat, redeploy. But Lee, Lee refuses. Lee's Blood is up. In other words, he's ready for a fight, and he's confident, and he thinks his army can do just about anything, like those Marines we talked about. (laughs) So we'll see. There are 65,000 Confederates facing 85,000 Federals. I'd said 100,000 earlier, but that was an approximation. There's a little bit less. But here's the problem. Again, Lee doesn't know. Part of the reason Lee does what he's about to do is he has no idea what the Union Army's strength is, because Stuart has still not reported back. Stewart is still out gallivanting around uh, trying to steal supplies, which that's good. The Confederates need those, but he's also doing this, I think, for his own pride and to get publicity and to, to, to just try to become more of a legend, if you will. Lee decides to order attacks on both ends of the Union line. So he's going to hit the Union right. That's at the top of the fish hook. And again, folks, if you can pull up a map on Google and take a look at it because this will make more sense. But if if you don't, just imagine this fish hook that starts uh, kind of at the top of the map and then curves left and then curves down. So on the Union right, they're on Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill. On the left, there's two, um, two hills called Big and Little Round Tops. Between the ends, the line ran across Cemetery Ridge. What do you think about that, Scott? Pretty good position? Yeah. Well, I mean, like you said about uh, Lee insisting upon attack and then the argument uh, with Longstreet, it's not a retreat, it's a redeploy. Um, Another thing that Lee said was that he's insisting on an attack. If the enemy is there tomorrow, we must attack him. And Longstreet replies, if he is there tomorrow, it will be because he wants you to attack. A good reason in my judgment for not doing so. So one of the ways that he justifies it in his uh, Gettysburg Battlefield report, Lee does, is that retreat would have been difficult and awaiting attack was impractical because of foraging difficulties. So that's yeah part of how he sees it, too. Yeah. So there's a philosophical disagreement here. Yeah, it's important that our listeners understand that this it wasn't just completely insane. I mean, Lee wasn't stupid. He, it's not like he just completely lost his mind. Uh, he had legitimate reasons for doing what he wanted to do. And he was a gambler. He had gambled in the past and it always paid off. So, uh, so let's not be too hard on Robert E. Lee here, but let's see what happens. So the union has, and by the way, talk again about you. Let me talk about interior lines with this nice curved tight position. The union can, can reinforce, like, let's say they're having trouble on the left. Well, they can move guys from the center to the left or from the right to the left or the left to the right or from anywhere very easily and quickly because their position position is curved in on itself. Whereas the Confederates, their position is, oh, should we use the words concave and convex? No, let's that's too, let's, too, ma- <laughs> let's too get into math class. Yeah. People are saying, hey, this is a history podcast, <laughs> not math. But um, it's very hard for the Confederacy to reinforce one side or the other. They'd have to travel great distances. 
But despite the fact that the Union has this terrific configuration, one Union Corps commander, one guy on the left, he decides he he has better ideas. He he knows a better way to do things, which is always dangerous. Without orders, he moves his corps off Seminary Ridge, moves it forward. He he thinks it's a better position. So he creates a huge gap in the Union line. It's sometimes you call it a salient or a bulge. So you've got this nice tight Union line, but whoop, one piece is missing. It's been pulled out front. Uh, so he moves it closer to the Confederate portion. He thinks he can use his artillery better. But as I mentioned, this creates a bulge and gaps in the Union line. Meade, the commanding general, overall General Meade, had to send units to plug the gaps in this week in the Union center and right. All right, A.P. Hill is sent towards the center, not to do a full attack, but just to keep them busy so that they can't reinforce uh, the, the right and the left. Longstreet is assigned the job of attacking the Union left. But Longstreet, as we've seen, he doesn't really believe in this. He, he understands what's going to happen. He understands how good the ground is that the Union army is on. And so he just isn't real fired up about it. And I don't know that he pushes it as best as he could. There's a, several reasons. But suffice it to say that he doesn't even launch the attack until 4 p.m. 4 p.m. So it's this is July. It's going to be dark in a few hours. His forces encounter stiff opposition in Devil's Den. Devil's Den is a heavily wooded and rocky area where Sickles' forces are. He doesn't expect Sickles to be there because Sickles is out of position. And there's also a wheat field and a peach orchard. So there's all kinds of obstacles. Uh, Sickles himself is injured in the fighting. He loses a leg. And he has an interesting backstory. I can't resist mentioning this, that one time he had caught his wife in bed with another man, and he went out and shot the man later. <laughs> and he was put on trial and was actually acquitted. So this is a fighter. <laughs> that, sounds like, that sounds like Tuesday morning for Andrew Jackson. So it was the Times. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, for Jackson, that's just, uh, it's just what you do. It's just a, another day's work, right? <laughs> <laughs> But Sickles, yeah, he's kind of Jacksonian in that way, and not a man to be uh, messed around with. But as an army commander or a corps commander, he's, he's not doing his job here, clearly. And he loses a leg uh, in the process. But Longstreet gets around to the Union far left, and he sends troops up the hill called Little Round Top. It's just south of Seminary Ridge, which is in the middle. And at first, the hill was undefended, but the last minute... A Union Corps is rushed to the top, and they push back repeated rebel assaults. And this is uh, one of the best parts of the movie, Gettysburg. And I'm sorry if y'all are tired of me talking about movies, but that's just tough because it's such a great movie, and I love it so much. I went to see it in the theater, you know, twice, a four-hour movie. That's how insane Did they have I an am. intermission? Uh, I think they did. Yeah. It, it was, I mean, this is like 1993, so I, it's, I don't remember. It's been 25 years, but... Anyway, I want to tell the great story of the 20th Maine. The 20th Maine Regiment was commanded by a former college professor named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. So you remember, Scott, when we were saying earlier that you could actually become a colonel by raising your own regiment? And you said, oh, that would be a terrible regiment. But not necessarily, because this man had no military experience. He'd never been to West Point. He, he taught philosophy and languages and religion and things like that. So... But he turned out to be a really good commander. He just had a knack for military stuff. And what happens is these Confederates are charging up the hill, and he's on the far left. It's very interesting, and there's a scene in the movie where one of his commanders comes up to him, and he says, look to your left, gentlemen. And they look, and he, he says, you will see that there's no one there. You are the extreme left of the Union line. You must not give way. You must hold this position at all costs. And so they do, they're getting, a lot of people are dying and getting hurt. The Confederates charge and they drive them back and the Confederates charge up the hill again and they drive them back. And it looks like the next assault by the Confederates is going to break the line. The 20th Maine is running out of ammunition. In fact, they do run out of ammunition. And so Chamberlain says, all right, fix bayonets. So they put their bayonets on the end of their rifle bullets and he does them swing around. He has them swing around, and they charge down the hill with their bayonets. So that's kind of like the rebel charge in reverse. They're not doing the rebel yell, but, <laughs> but they, they charge down the hill, and the Confederates are shocked. They, they're not expecting this. 
they they didn't expect all these screaming blue coats to be coming down the hill at them and so a lot of them end up surrendering and so joshua lawrence chamberlain the former college professor becomes the hero of day two of gettysburg at least for the union that is <laughs> not for the confederates they they capture as prisoners 400 confederates and they save the union left they keep it from buckling so that's a great story and again i Everybody definitely want to read the book and watch the movie. Um, at one point, the Union Center develops a mile-long gap. That's a pretty darn long gap, a mile long. The rebels threaten to cut it in two, but Meade plugs the hole at the last minute. And it, we've seen a lot of last-minute heroics, haven't we, in, in these battles. At dusk, Ewell attacks the Union right. He almost takes Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill, but he narrowly fails. And that evening... Uh, so this, this basically, we've in summary, there were a lot of Confederate attacks, a lot of bloody fighting, and the Confederates come so close. They come so close in so many parts of the Union line, but they just don't quite break through. They don't quite push the Union back. And, uh, and that's especially amazing when you consider the good ground that the Union troops were on. Longstreet again goes to Robert E. Lee, and he says, can we please redeploy? Can we please move around and get behind the Union uh, soldiers, and, and Lee says, no, I'm not. The, once again, the enemy is there. I will attack him there. Hey, everyone. Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Are you concerned about tensions in the Middle East? Do you wonder where we're currently at in the biblical timeline? Are we really in the last days? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carl Muller with the Inside the Epicenter podcast. Every week, my co-host, best-selling author Joel Rosenberg, and I answer those questions and more. You'll hear inside knowledge of our meetings with leaders at the highest levels of government in the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East, equipping you to filter the news with biblically sound insights. Find Inside the Epicenter on your favorite podcast app or go to joshuafund.com to listen and subscribe. Hello, this is Dr. Doug Grotheis, host of Truth Tribe, where we seek the truth through reason and evidence about what matters most. And we are not tribal since truth is for everyone. Please join me at the Truth Tribe as I discuss the reasons for Christian faith, the Christian worldview, and moral issues such as abortion and gender ideology. To listen now, go to lifeaudio.com or search Truth Tribe on your favorite podcast app. Well, first of all, I'm really inspired as a university humanities instructor. So I guess both James, you and I, um, if there are any uh, military recruiters out there, I, I just hearing the story, I think both of us could be effective commanders if you just drop us in Afghanistan, Absolutely. Afghanistan we'll, or wherever troops are stationed now. We'll hit the books. We're quick studies. We promise. Yeah, it's I mean, I think I could handle um, helicopter corps, whatever. <laughs> It'd be easy. So no problem. Modern. Modern warfare is, I think, a slightly more complicated. Not that this was easy, but... A couple more know. moving parts, one could say. But um, what did I know? I didn't go to West Point like all these guys, so I am not qualified. But yeah, just taking a step back, uh, now that we've wrapped up the second day. Now, like you said, it came within an inch of the Confederacy breaking the line. So it's very easy to imagine counterfactuals where they were successful, and there are many innumerable factors that we just don't perhaps don't even know about that could have uh, caused it not to happen. So on the one hand, I don't want to read too much into Confederate defeat. But on the other hand, they did lose and we read into things. This is what we do. So some of the criticisms, I mean, as you already said, there's Lee ordering a frontal attack against the objections of division commanders. But another criticism I've seen of Lee is that he didn't properly support them when they did launch their attack. So Lee stands by why Hill's uh, third corps is in the center of the Confederate line, and he does little to assist Longstreet. So he's not going after the right point in the line. He's not supporting uh, the attack effectively enough. So there's another opportunity that he missed. And I don't know if this is his last one to really uh, turn the battle. Yesterday would have been an even bigger chance that he missed uh, when the 
uh, forces weren't as outmatched as they are now. But okay, day three. Now this is the thing. This is the meat of the Battle of Gettysburg. This is the bit that if anyone knows anything about it, it's this. So let's jump into it. So July 3rd, day three of Gettysburg. What's happening? All righty. Day three, Lee orders another attack on Culp's Hill. Again, this is on the uh, Union right, the Confederate left, and both of the lines are running roughly north to south. Uh, The attack on Culp's Hill once again fails as the third day in a row that the Confederates failed to take that hill. And General Stewart was supposed to get behind the Federals and attack them by the rear. He had returned by this point. There's a very great scene in the movie where Lee has to basically uh, fuss at Stewart. He has to let him know that he's let him down, and Stewart offers to resign. And, of course, Lee says no. Uh, But Stewart is now put into action. He's trying to get behind the Federals and attack them. But he stopped. Again, here we see Federal cavalry rising to the challenge. And the Federal cavalry that stopped Stuart were led in part, he wasn't the senior commander, but he was there, by a 23-year-old general named George Armstrong Custer, who will have a big future, (laughs) as everybody knows. So many cameos in the Civil War. I know. I I can't resist name dropping from time to time. We've we've seen people like James Garfield and George Custer. They're going to come along and have even more bigger roles to play in the future. But anyway, so by late morning on the 3rd, Lee felt that the Union Center would be weakened because he believed that they had sent many troops to the right and the left. If you remember, Lee had ordered savage attacks. The Confederates had fought very, very hard on the Union right and left. And Lee just assumed that because he had, they'd fought so hard there and, and inflicted so many casualties that the Union Center would have had to have sent people to reinforce, and then therefore the Union Center is going to be weak. It's a reasonable assumption. Um, he orders three divisions, 13,000 men, uh, under the command of George Pickett, Isaac Trimble, and Johnson Pettigrew to march about a mile up a gentle slope and attack the Union soldiers on Cemetery Ridge, who I remind you are dug in. They're behind earthworks. This is the probably one of the most infamous things that happened in the Civil War. It's been one of the most questioned and argued decisions that any commander made in the Civil War. Actually, Longstreet is in command of this. Uh, one of my professors in uh, – well, my undergraduate professor that I took Civil War under, he said it really should be called Longstreet's Assault, not Pickett's Charge, because Pickett was just one of three commanders. But for whatever reason, Pickett's uh, division, it was the main one. And so he gets the <laughs> he gets to go through all Poor time. Guy. Yeah, I know. Pickett's Charge. Um, Meade saw it coming. He knew this was going to happen. Uh, Meade was not surprised and he was ready. The Confederates begin with an artillery barrage of the hill, so they're firing every cannon. They're hitting them with everything they have. Union artillery responded, and then all of a sudden, the Union artillery stops. By the way, this is the largest artillery barrage ever to occur in the Western Hemisphere. It was heard as far away as Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is 40 miles away. Okay, so again... The Union guns fall silent, and so Lee just assumes the Union artillery had been disabled. Makes sense, right? Why would they stop firing? They know we're coming, but they stopped. Ergo, they must have uh, had all, most, or if not all, their cannon damaged or destroyed or something. So Pickett goes to Longstreet, who again, Longstreet's really in command. Pickett says, what is your order? Give me the order, sir. Longstreet knows what's going to happen. He knows this is going to be a disaster. Doesn't want any part of it. And he couldn't even bear to give the order. He just nodded. He just kind of waved his hand and nodded. And so Pickett's all excited. Pickett is, Pickett's troops are fresh. We, we talked about earlier that they had been away and they had just joined the army. They were the last Confederate division to fall into line. So off they march. And as soon as they start marching, and this is just a imagine, a, and this is there, the scene that of this in the movie is like 20 minutes long. It's it's really really long. It's epic. It's one of the best battle scenes I've ever seen. Anyway, they've got this long long line slowly marching up this gentle slope, wide open, just perfect killing field, really. And they're going and they're going, uh, and all of a sudden. 
surprise, surprise, the Union artillery opens up again. So, so much for the theory that the Union artillery was messed up. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. Thank you very much. The Union uh, uh, commander had actually said, hey, just be quiet for a while. Stop. He, he tricked them into thinking maybe uh, they were damaged. So, but they weren't. And so this artillery barrage rips through the attacking Confederate army. They decimate the Confederate line. And about half of the Confederates are either killed or wounded. The attackers, by the way, were forbidden to fire until they were right up on the Union lines. You didn't want them stopping and firing. You wanted them to get across that open field as fast as possible so they could get to the top of the hill. Or the ridge, rather. It's not, not really a hill. Um, by the end of the charge, only a few Confederates reached the Union position, but all of them were either killed or captured. The Confederates retreated to where they started, but only about half make it back. And I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, I remember from reading the Killer Angels and some other things that I think seven generals were killed or wounded in this attack and 13 colonels, almost every single colonel. The colonel is the commander of a regiment, which is supposed to have a thousand people, but probably by now only has three or four hundred. But so, I mean, just not only does it wipe out half of the men, but it takes out almost all the leadership as well. So the Confederates straggle back to where they started. Lee goes up to Pickett and he says, rally your division for a possible counterattack. Uh, and Pickett just says to General Lee, he says, General Lee, I have no division. Famous line, very, very sad. And Pickett never forgave Lee. Later on, he, he was writing and he said, he, in his writings, he said, that man destroyed my division. And Lee realizes it's been a complete disaster. It's Fredericksburg in reverse. Just a suicidal assault on a fortified position. And Lee says to the men, this is all my fault. It's all my fault. And the men are going, no, 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 of course. Robert E. Lee doesn't make mistakes, right? But in this case, I think he did. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And something else I saw with Pickett is that at some point, Lee and Longstreet are trying to console him. And Lee... Imagine all the heroics in the chivalry of the Civil War. He tells him that their gallantry had earned them a place in history. Well, that's not a pick-me-up for Pickett. And then he says in response, All the glory in the world could never atone for the widows and orphans this day. And yeah, like you said, he's uh, bl he blames Lee for the rest of his life for the massacre. We should point out that this Pickett's charge is infamous for the reasons you just described here. And... From my education, especially my uh, high school education, I remember very little of the Civil War, but I think for a lot of history teachers who don't know much about the Civil War, they'll glom on to this fact to say, oh, look at these people. They were idiots. They were storming on an open field just to be picked off by someone with a rifle that could be accurate up to a few hundred yards. But as you and I have talked about many times in this series, on the very top of the episode that, as you said, the technology to kill had advanced, but the technology to heal had not. Um, sometimes there were simply fortified positions that you could not advance in your strategy unless you took those positions. Sometimes there was no better option to do that because you didn't have any better technology to um, resist the rifles. And it's not as if the Union didn't do the same thing. Uh, if you go back in the archives a little bit, uh, for History Unplugged, uh, you can find an interview where I talked to the director of the uh, Manassas National Park. And the Battle of Second Manassas, there's a reverse situation of the Union where they're storming an open field like this, and then they have to withdraw to disastrous effect like Pickett's Charge. And the guest on the episode said that there were men who, Confederate soldiers who were firing on these Union troops, and they themselves were also at Gettysburg, and they commented that this is as bad or maybe even worse than Gettysburg. And with the um, director that I talked to, they were actually doing an excavation of a surgeon's pit where they found two intact skeletons of Union soldiers. And they could determine through forensic evidence that one had been shot in the buttocks uh, as he was probably fleeing. And for hundreds of yards, they had to run. So this was done on both sides. But, um, but just one other thing I want to mention with this, as you, you were saying, James, that Lee told the troops, this is all my fault. And many of them must have been dumbfounded because... Some of them commented that up till then, they had, like much of the Confederate Army, they had almost blind faith in Lee. They 
thought that everything would come out all right, even if they couldn't understand the orders that were being given, even if it didn't seem to make sense from their perspective. Many could assume that, well, there's a grand strategy here that I can't see the forest for the trees because General Lee had planned it. So, But there's one historian, Bevan Alexander, who criticized his order and said, when his direct efforts to knock aside the Union forces failed, Lee compounded his error by destroying the last offensive power of the Army of Northern Virginia and Pickett's charge across nearly a mile of open bullet and shell torn ground. So he thinks that the frontal assault was doomed before it started. Yeah, let me let me follow up on that. And, and defensively, um, he came so close on day two, and he he really felt if we just hit him one more time, one more punch, they'll fall over. He felt like they were just ready to collapse. They, they'd done so much damage to the Union line. And it it almost broken through one more knockout punch will do it. And he had fresh troops. So it wasn't completely insane, although he should have known better because he knew what happened at Fredericksburg. And we've seen we've seen this and it's going to continue to happen where even though these generals know that attacking a fortified position across an open field in a regular frontal assault is totally insane. uh, They do it anyway. I mean, Grant's going to do it, believe it or not, later on. What else are you going to do? Yeah, sometimes it just seems like there's no alternative. Right. Sherman's going to do it. Great, you know. So we're going to see everybody tries it at least once or twice. Maybe they think, well, these other guys can't do it, but but these got my I can and my men can. So we're going to see that the the frontal assault is is not about to go away anytime soon, despite this. So to give the listeners another uh, shot, because you've given them a lot with uh, uh, mentioning movies, James. Uh, Classic Napoleonic tactics that uh, were effective in the early 1800s when you have muskets, but with rifled bullets, not so good. So Napoleonic tactics, another reason why they don't belong in the 1860s or they need to be updated. Yeah. Okay. Remember, listeners, remember the rule. Whenever Scott (laughs) mentions Napoleon or or tactics, you get... Take a shot of your favorite beverage, and whenever I mention a movie, <laughs> boy, they're gonna, <laughs> depending on what you're drinking, you may be kind of about to fall out of the chair by now. But. Make it whiskey or apple brandy, or is yeah. that what they? What was the apple drink they had back then? Hard was cider. Hard that cider. Was, uh, yeah. William Henry Harrison's favorite drink. Yeah. Uh, hard. Get your hard cider, or your whiskey, uh, but not if you're driving, folks. Please. <laughs> All right. Well, um, let's uh, just take a look at the outcome. I mean, we always we always tally the results at the end of these major battles, and it doesn't get much more major than Gettysburg. So it does yeah. not get much more major. That is a good point. This is the granddaddy of them all. The Confederates suffer twenty eight thousand casualties. That is one third of their army. So think about that. For every three guys that crossed the Potomac and marched into Pennsylvania, one is gone. Seventeen of fifteen. I'm sorry, 17 of 52 Confederate generals were casualties. I talked earlier about the generals that were killed just in Pickett's charge. Well, others were killed in other parts of the battle. The Union lost about 23,000 men. So the total number of casualties is 51,000. That's killed, wounded, missing. Yeah, 51,000. That is huge. And that makes Gettysburg the bloodiest battle of the Civil War in terms of total casualties. Now, I want to say real quick that a couple of our listeners may be thinking, now that's three different battles you've said are the bloodiest. So which one is true? So Gettysburg gets the prize for the most total killed. And it's, you know, it's over three days. So that's not too surprising. Uh, Antietam was the single bloodiest day. It's the bat- it, Antietam had more people killed in one day than any other of the battles of the Civil War. And then we talked about a battle in Tennessee called Murfreesboro or Stones River. That one had the highest percentage of casualties. So I don't want to have our people be confused. But this one takes the prize in the total uh, body count. Many regiments were almost destroyed. One Tennessee regiment started with 960 men when Gettysburg, that's at the beginning of the war. When the Battle of Gettysburg began, they had only 365 left. By the end of the first day, there were only 60 by the end of the battle, there were only three, Ooh. three men. That's not much of a regiment. Lee realizes now he really does have to retreat. He can't stay any longer. So he retreats back to Virginia on July 4th. And, of course, this has a lot of symbolic significance. Uh, Same day as Manassas, or uh, not Manassas, um, uh, Vicksburg. 
Vicksburg. Yeah. And it's Independence Day. It's, it's a Northern holiday. And so a lot of people have a tendency to think maybe God is shining on us. Lee has to retreat. Not only does he retreat, but he retreats on July 4th. And as you mentioned, they get the news of Vicksburg. And so it is a great day for the Union. Meade wanted to pursue Lee's army. He really wanted to. Uh, but doing so was nearly impossible. The Confederate position would have been too strong. And we've talked about this many times, how a, an army is usually as just as exhausted from winning as they are from losing. So Meade isn't able to do a whole lot. Lincoln doesn't really understand this. I mean, this, this battle is definitely a Union victory, no question about it. The Union inflicted more casualties, and they held the ground by the end of the battle. But many in the North felt it should have been a much bigger victory. Lincoln was disappointed that Meade did, Meade did not do more to destroy Lee's army. And the Confederacy, believe it or not, does not see it as a major disaster. It had no negative effect on Lee's reputation, at least not at the time, although Longstreet later said much later wrote that Gettysburg was ground of no value. That day was the saddest day of my life. You're right. And I think, like you said earlier, it it's easy to beat up on Lee uh, after Gettysburg. But there were points where he was close. And in his mind, it very he might be thinking, well, I didn't win, but I should have won. Tactics that did work in the past and strategic moves. And one example, I thought this was an interesting uh, conversation he had uh, after the battle ended. It was either the night of the 4th or the next day. Uh, so at night, he's riding alone among his troops. And he meets a brigadier general, John Imboden. Imboden? I don't know. You probably know how better to pronounce that. I'm not sure. Okay. So he meets a brigadier general of a Imboden, Imboden, one of those, uh, who says, General, this has been a hard day for you. And he responds, Yes, it has been a sad, sad day to us. And he praises Pickett's men. and But then he says, If they had been supported as they were to have been, but for some reason not fully explained to me were not, we would have held the position and the day would have been ours. Too bad. So General Alexander, he found the statement kind of strange because Lee was a commanding general and he had seen the entire preparation and ex execution. But maybe in Lee's mind, he wanted to give his officers leeway and certain actions which had been faithfully executed in the past weren't now. So it didn't even seem to be clear in his mind um, why it lost. And maybe we can give some room for the gray areas in this too. But uh, so is Gettysburg the turning point of the war as so many people say it is? What do you think? That's a good question. For I was always taught in school, oh, this is the turning point of the war. Uh, now, most scholars today will say, no, it was not. Almost nothing changed. I mean, yes, the Confederates had to retreat. It did stop Confederate momentum. So it's not like it's insignificant. It, it's a very significant battle. But turning point of the war is probably a little bit too much. This is, this is the last time Lee would invade the North, and it probably made European intervention impossible. But, of course, they didn't know this at the time. They didn't know Lee's never going to invade the North again. This is the high water mark of the Confederacy, as some people say it. I don't really believe, I don't subscribe to a single turning point of the Civil War. I believe that there were several uh, key points, several turning points, if you will, and, and a lot of them are the battles we're mentioning in these uh, podcasts. But no, it, it, we're going to see that the war is going to go on for almost two more years. And the Confederates are going to continue to fight on, and they're going to fight hard, and they're going to fight well. Robert E. Lee is going to continue to lead the army quite well. The Union is going to continue to struggle. Sorry to give away the spoiler, everybody. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the war does not end after Gettysburg, not even close, not by any means. So, so no, not the turning point. Uh, just one of many, many key actions that did influence the war quite significantly. And this is getting a little bit into historiography or how history is made. These ideas that it's a turning point, that's an effective hook, a fact that you would remember for a high school exam. And maybe there's a history professor who's writing one of these textbooks for high schoolers. Which, by the way, man, I wish I could have gotten into one of those games because that is how you make some cash as a history professor. Yeah. And there are way, few ways to do so. The best, of course, is to write a book and then force all of your university students to buy it so you have endless royalties and commission coming in. Uh, but I digress. What I was going to say is that you give these simple narratives or simple facts, 
But usually you can find some sort of quote to glom onto that supports your thesis, and it makes it seem very clear-cut. And I just want to show you a quote that I think is popular for people who want to create this clean narrative of Gettysburg as a turning point. And if all you had was the statement that Gettysburg, Gettysburg is a turning point in this quote, you would think it it being as simple as that. So the Confederate chief of ordnance, uh, Josiah Gorgas, on July 28th, this is after Gettysburg, this is after Vicksburg, and he's bemoaning the change in rebel fortunes. It seems like they everything was going, the wind was at their back, and now they're issued these major defeats. So what he says after Lee failed at Gettysburg and he recrossed Potomac and he resumed the position of two months ago, um, covering Richmond. Alas, he has lost 15,000 men and 25,000 stands of arms. Vicksburg and Port Hudson capitulated, surrendering 35,000 men and 45,000 arms. It seems incredible that human power could affect such a change in so brief a space. Yesterday, we rode on the pinnacle of success. Today, absolute ruin seems to be our portion. The Confederacy totters to its destruction. But it doesn't because, as you said, it goes on for two more years. So what happens is, so you said Lee doesn't really take a hit, um, but does he feel a little bit guilty about his performance in Gettysburg, James? He does, and so much so that he actually writes Jefferson Davis and offers to resign Davis, of course, had nothing. <laughs> we wouldn't have any of that. He said, no, 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 you're not resigning. Your res- resignation is not accepted. I mean, who's going to replace Robert E. Lee? Yeah, like we say, it's um, qualities that seem to serve him well in the past of aggressiveness, of giving his officers enough f- flexibility to handle situations that require that kind of flexibility that suited him well in the past, especially early in the war, seemed to hurt him. So, James, I mean, people hear uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. What do you think, when you've taught students, what do they associate with Gettysburg if they don't know much else? Uh, They probably think about Robert E. Lee. They think about Pickett's Charge. They probably think about, uh, maybe even they think it's the turning point of the war. They think it's a a big battle, all of which are correct, except for the turning point part. but (laughs) (laughs) But they don't know much more than that. Well, I think, too, uh, it's uh, worth taking a second to uh, mention the Gettysburg Address, because many people hear that but don't connect it with the battle, but this is directly what Lincoln is speaking of. So, yeah, could you mention some things about the conditions in which he composes the speech and surveys the battlefield? Yes. Um, So Lincoln decides that they're going to did it. They had to, obviously, they lost so many men there, they didn't have the ability to embalm all these people and to send them back to their homes. So most of the people that are killed have to be buried right there on the battlefield, Union and Confederate. Lincoln decides to dedicate part of the battlefield as a national cemetery, which happens on a lot of battlefields. There's one at Shiloh. There's one at most, or at least many of the battlefields. Um, So they have a dedication ceremony that November and it's, There's all these dignitaries there, and they. Lincoln's not even the main speaker. Lincoln is just asked to give a few thoughts, a few reflections. The main speaker is a man named Edward Everett, who was a former. uh, He was an academic. He was a politician. He had held a cabinet position at one point. Edward Everett goes on and speaks for two hours, and that's not uncommon for that day, right? If you. Today, we think, oh, my gosh, I couldn't listen to somebody talk for two hours but because we have such short attention spans. But Lincoln gets up there. He pulls out a piece of paper, and he says, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are men on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that our nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be 
here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. And he sat down, and it was so fast that a cameraman was trying to take a picture of him, and he just barely <laughs> got a blur of Lincoln walking back to sit down, <laughs> because you know the cameras took a long time to get set up, and took a while to take the photos. And of course, this becomes, at the time, it wasn't really acknowledged as a great speech, but over time, it gained a lot of credibility and a lot of fame, and now we memorize it, and it's considered to be one of our greatest speeches. So, And it is. It's, it's a magnificent speech. Edward Everett went up to Lincoln later, and he said, you said more in two minutes than I said in two hours. Brevity is the soul of wit, as William Shakespeare said, and he's right. Absolutely, Yes. All right. Well, um, a lot of interesting things uh, that we've gone over in this episode. This changes the narrative of uh, what's been happening. I don't know how did Win- uh, Winston Churchill say after in 1941 um, or after Dunkirk that this is not the end. This is not the beginning of the end, but this is the I can't even figure out my mind. It just jumps around from end and beginning and end. But it is the end of the beginning. Do I have that right? Uh, something like that. Okay. I really <laughs> didn't, gonna... really didn't stick the landing there. Okay. <laughs> but you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. So we yes. see that, um, obviously the Confederate army is not invincible. We saw that on the Western front. We saw that on the Eastern front tactics that served Lee very well, did not work. His orders are too vague and discretionary. He's not always, even though he had the freedom of movement to choose in time and place of battle, he doesn't use it correctly. So, uh, chinks in the armor starting to appear, but still have a lot of ground to cover. So James, where will the next episode take us? We're going to go back out west. We're going to see that Grant, because of his great success at Vicksburg, is going to get a promotion and he's going to be recalled and brought east. He's going to stop off in Tennessee. We're going to have a couple of really key battles called Chattanooga and Chickamauga, one one in southeastern Tennessee and one in northern Georgia. And then we'll see what happens with those. And then we're going to see uh, eventually what happens when Grant comes all the way to the east and takes command of the Army of the Potomac. All right. We'll see you there. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles in the Civil War podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show in the podcast player of your choice and leave us a rating and a review. This helps us grow and reach new listeners. You can also find maps of the battle sites show notes each episode, and plenty of other history info by going to keybattlesinthecivilwar.com.